So good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the SJC Language Center. Uh, I would just like to say a few words about that first before I do my other introductions, but I, I want to say uh, a very warm welcome to all of you, to uh, my colleagues around the world, my colleagues in India, uh, my students, uh, our Language Center attendees, all of you, thank you so much for coming. Uh, we don't we have a guest lecture whenever there's a fifth Saturday. So it has been a while, I think July maybe, but it has been a while since we've had a guest lecture. So we're very, really happy to do that today. Let me just say a few words about the Language Center for those of you uh, uh, who are new to us. The link for the website is in the chat. And if you click on that and on the home page, uh, you will uh, scroll down a little bit and you'll see where you can subscribe to get our, we don't send out a lot of emails, we don't uh, bombard you, but we do send out reminders uh, for our events. And uh, speaking of our events, let me just quickly say that the SJC Language Center has an activity online uh, every Saturday at five o'clock India time. And your students and also you are all welcome to come. A lot of teachers come just to get ideas for their classes. On the first Saturday of the month, we have Conversation Club. Second Saturday of the month, we have Reader's Theater. Third Saturday, we have Discussion and Debate. And fourth Saturday, we have Grammar Brush Ups and Fun Learn Club. So I would like to just ask my team. Uh, I have a team of uh, masters and graduates of SJC, St. Joseph's College. Uh, who helped me with all of these events. And if they could just turn on their videos and uh, just say hello, that would be great. There's Salishma, she does the Conversation Club. Shweta, who does the Reader's Theater. And Shifa, there she is, uh, who does Discussion and Debate. I do Grammar Brush Ups, and then I share that hour with uh, Bhavna. Mm -hmm. And also I would like to mention our new initiative which is tutoring. We're having a pilot program for the next, uh, yeah. next now two months. Uh, the pilot program uh, is a, a time where we can just test our ground. So we have a team of 11 tutors and uh, they are offering one-on-one -on -one tutoring to students and to teachers who maybe need a little help with something. So I do have a couple of uh, seasoned teachers on our tutoring team and we also have uh, third year degree students and also a couple of master's students who are doing one-on-one -on -one tutoring and I I'm not sure I know that uh, Kanchana's here she could turn on her video maybe I'm not sure are any of my other tutors here could you turn on your videos quickly they may not be here yet there's Kanchana she is originally from Chennai. She's living now in Nigeria. And she is a published author, writes a lot of short stories. So if you need any help with your writing, please contact the Language Center and Sanma. we'll send you an application. And then we'll hook you up with one of our free tutors. What a plan, right? So that's about us, uh, the SJC Language Center. And uh, just want to welcome you all and say, please, uh, join us, please uh, contact us through the website or our email. And uh, we will give you more information and try to help you with languages. Right now we're focusing on English, but we are also doing tutoring in Hindi. And eventually we hope to have conversations in, in several different languages. Yes, did somebody say my name? I did. I thought you had frozen and might be having difficulty with the connection. It's okay. It's good now. Please continue. Oh, okay. Yes. Well, you know, even though I'm right now in the U.S., sometimes we have internet problems. So uh, please do let me know. Okay. So again, thank you and welcome to everyone. That's a little bit about our Language Center. The websites uh, are in the chat. And now I would like to um, uh, welcome our Guest speaker, let me just give a little introduction, please, about Ruth Good. And she is in New Delhi right now. We are joined today also by her assistant, Shweta Khanna. But Ruth joined the Department of State 
as the regional English language officer in 2019, the same year that I uh, got uh, sent to uh, Vishakapatnam as Rilo Ruth uh, right now is assigned to the <coughs> New Delhi uh, embassy. And she's responsible for a lot of things, everything to do with English, really, designing programs, managing and advising on programs, supporting English language learning, but not just in India, in Afghanistan and Bhutan also. The best thing about Ruth is she has so many years of experience in the field of language teaching, um, not just in foreign service, but she has worked for the Peace Corps. She has, um, done many English language curriculum and teacher training reforms uh, in Algeria and even a project in Myanmar. She worked, uh, I don't see it on her bio, but I believe that she uh, worked for, I'm trying to think Ruth, was it Cambridge? Um, I ran a teacher training program in San Francisco for the University of Cambridge, the CELTA program. Okay, the so CELTA, that's what I was trying to think of. Thank you. Yes. All right. And also, um, she served as senior English language fellow in Peru. And uh, I do, I will mention that she has a Master of Arts Applied Linguistics uh, degree and also in practice-based educational research and doctorate education. So she comes to us with so much experience and so down to earth and a wonderful boss, if I might say so myself. I have a boss in Vizek Avas in Hyderabad, but over everyone is Ruth Good. So I was just so honored that she accepted our invitation to speak today and we'll, I'll turn it over to her and she'll share and we will save time at the end for questions and answers. So once again, if I could just remind you to stay muted until the end uh, or put your question in the chat and we will do those at the end. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Ruth, and thank you so much for being with us this evening. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks so much for inviting me. So first of all, I'm going to see if I can share my screen. Let's see how that goes. Uh, Perfect. Please be perfectly. Great. That's good to know. And let us hope the internet gods are with us today and we don't have too many um, disconnections. That's always a chance. So thanks for the nice introduction, Vicky. Yes, I've done many different things in my life, but one of the things that I really enjoy thinking about is language variation and um, world Englishes. So when Vicky asked me to talk about this, um, I thought that it might be fun just to um, chat for a moment with that. So, so if you've read the kind of flyer, the advertisement, you'll see that we're hoping to talk a little bit about language and dialect. You know, what, what's a language? What's a dialect? What's the difference? So, secondly, we're going to be talking about uh, language change how and why do languages change over time? And how does that affect um, English? And then I think the big question that many of you may want to know the answer to is what is the best kind of English? And if you wait until the very end, I'm gonna tell you. Okay, and I, I, I hope it will be a bit of a surprise. All right, so, so with that, I'm going to start with uh, three questions for you to think about. I'm not somebody who believes in talking at people. So the first question I'm going to ask you is, what is language? And I'm going to ask you to think and write some answers in the chat box. I'll give you about a minute to do that. There is absolutely no possibility that there can be a wrong answer. So just write your answer to the question, what is language? Write it in the chat box. And please put yourself on mute if you can. Okay, so what is language? That's the first question. And actually, interestingly, because I'm so new at this, I can't see my screw uh, the chat box. 
So Vicki, as some of those- Yes, I can see it. Sometimes you have to open your chat before you share your screen. But anyway, uh -uh. a lot of people are saying that it's a means of communication, but a type Lovely. of expressiveness. And okay. um, well, here's a very deep one. Language is a set of predetermined strings of sounds and symbols used as a tool to communicate, to connect, and to, get, and to get what you need. Oh, um, that must be Professor somebody or other. <laughs> uh, That's so wonderful. Most of these systems of communication, expressions of thoughts. Great. I, and now I found my chat box. So language okay. is a way to communicate with each other and express thoughts. Language is a substitute for silence. I love that. That's a great definition. Thank you very much. And thank you, Vicky, for reading those out. So, so I'd like you to take those thoughts, those, um, your ideas, and now I'd like you to think about these questions. So is the way that monkeys communicate a language? Is sign language a language? Is the way that you and your friends communicate with special words or gestures a language, right? Uh, what about computer languages? Are they languages? What about the way that bees communicate to tell each other where the flowers with the most pollen are? Is that a language? I like to ask questions more than I, I give answers. So I'm just going to let you sit with those questions for a minute. I, I don't know that I or anybody else has a, a definitive answer, but let's let's leave you with that for a moment. Here's another, um, here's one, one de definition I have. Um, I don't know if you'll like this one. It works for me, no definition is perfect. All definitions depend on the context you're trying to define. So for me, a language is a system of symbols and rules. By symbols, we could mean words or sounds, those are symbols, and rules that tell us in which order they go or what rules can mean this thing or what rules can mean that thing. For communicating, right? So, so by that definition, I think all the things we have just described are languages. I'm not going to get into a discussion with you about my definition. I just think it's interesting to think about it. And thanks, uh, Deepika and Sweta, uh, for uh, agreeing with me. I love it when people agree with me, but I also love it when people disagree with me. So thank you. So here's another question for you. What's a dialect? And again, I'd like you to put your answers in the chat, but what's a dialect? A form or variation of a language, yes, yes. A regional language, great. Again, there are no wrong answers here, be brave. Thanks, Azra, for that. Thanks, Vicky, for your suggestion. What else have we got? What's a dialect? A particular form of language which is peculiar to a specific region or social group. Nice definition. Dialect is the way how you write particular language. These are great. Language used in a separate region, great. Regional variations of a language evolved in separate contexts. Wonderful. Certain ways a language is spoken. Wow, nice, nice. You are way too smart for me. A variation of producing language with different sounds. That's lovely. Okay, now, here's the next question. I, I don't have an answer for that one, but what's the difference between a language and a dialect, right? Again, please write your answers in the chat box. What's the difference between a language and a dialect? You're way smarter than her. <laughs> Thanks. I'm gonna ask you all to mute if that's okay. What's the difference between a language and a dialect? A language is a set code of communication and I'm waiting for the, for the next bit. This is a difficult question, isn't it? 
A language is not specific to a region, but a larger part of the state or country, whereas a dialect is a variation of languages. Language is like a home, a dialect, it's windows. I love that, that metaphor. Thank you. A dialect is a subsidiary ver variation of a language. Generally, a language is written as well as spoken, while a dialect, oh, these are coming in thick and fast. I'm having a hard time keeping up. Well, a dialect is just spoken until it is promoted to the elite status, usually for political purposes. I love that. That's great. Think about that, status and political purposes. So language is a method of human communication. The dialect is a variation of that language. Wow. Language, the outer circle, dialect in the famous. Oh, dialects are mutually intelligible. Beautiful. Wow, great definitions. And Shifa, just to take the last one, language is a means of communication and dialect is a variety. Yeah, so I think, all, I think we all agree that this idea that dialects right. are that varieties of a language. But let's, um, let's, go back to some of um, my ideas. Hold on a second. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the oranges. Uh -huh, oranges. Now, there's a new variation. <laughs> the origins of language. Yeah. So think back. Think back millions of years to the times when animals were emerging from the prehistoric swamps. Animals that breathe make noise when they breathe. And when they are afraid, when they were afraid, they probably made one kind of noise. And when they were angry, they probably made another. And over time, those noises probably became, began to be understood by other animals. And over time, animals who were able to communicate their ideas to each other, who were able to communicate that they were afraid, probably lived longer than um, animals that didn't, right? So over millions and millions of years, Animals, including monkeys and the monkeys who became human, probably developed hundreds and thousands of symbolic noises. And I have to say, my husband corrected me and he said, no, it wasn't monkeys that became human. They were two separate branches of the evolutionary tree. So for simplicity, let's say the proto-humans. So as the number of symbols grew, um, those, those proto-humans probably developed a system. For example, an early development might have been a symbolic noise or sound to show not or negative. I, uh, he's dangerous, he's not dangerous. That dinosaur is going to eat me, that dinosaur is not going to eat me. So later a symbol to show a question might have emerged or later a symbol to show uh, the difference between male or female or, you know, so that's I think how in general, I think we probably agree that that's how languages emerges. So over time, humans develop very complicated systems of communication. But because these early humans were spread around the world and because they lived in relatively small groups, the meaning of symbolic sounds and systematic patterns, or we can think grammar or morphology or phonology, the, the meaning of symbolic sounds and systematic patterns that these people developed were probably very different. So let's talk a little bit about language change, elements of language change. I think, and, and bear in mind, I am absolutely not an expert on this. I'm just an enthusiast. I think there are three things, three main things that influence language change right? There's natural processes of language change. I think over time, languages tend, on the one hand, to become more regular. Grammatical patterns tend to become more regular, provided there are no external influences. And on the other hand, sometimes um, we, we develop finer and finer shades of meaning, so these things that happen over time, these are just natural processes. Sometimes words drop out from the, the lexicon, words disappear because we don't have dinosaurs anymore, or there is no special word to mean the, the noise a dinosaur makes that is about when he's going to eat you. I, I, I bet you they had a special word for that 10,000 years ago, or however many. So there are natural processes of language change, right? Um, I think we can also talk about distance and we can talk about time. Let's, let's look at each one of these. Excuse me while I juggle screens. Here we go. Uh-oh, wrong one. Sorry, wrong screen. 
so um oh and here are some more elements of language change i, I forgot about these so so geography i think is important it's not just distance it's not just the people in the north of the Sahara speak differently from the people in the south of the Sahara Desert because it's a long way away. It depends on if there are rivers or mountain ranges in between that affect people's ability to communicate with each other, right? So if people can communicate with each other, it's more likely that their languages will be similar. If people can't communicate with each other, it's more likely that their languages will be different. So geography plays a role in language change, right? War plays a role in language change. Um, so I think we've seen in Europe the ways in which in, in England we saw how um, invaders from the north brought, um, brought uh, um, Scandinavian influence, uh, invaders from northern Europe, Germany brought those influence invaders from the south, specifically the Romans brought those influences. Um, and, and in India, you've seen how invaders from, from the west, from Persia, have brought those influences, how invaders from the north, from the Mongolia, what was historically Mongolia, have brought those influence. So, so war definitely plays a role. In, in the United States, we've seen how the many, many languages of Native America have largely been wiped out because of the invasions of mostly Europeans, French, uh, Spanish, um, Germans, etc., cetera, et cetera, and to some degree, um, the British. Um, weather. Weather has some kind of effect. Um, sorry, let me just go to my screen here. So, for example, if there's a big drought or if the climate changes, I think the, 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 the environment will change and the things in the environment will change. And so, um, so the names of things will change. If there are floods, uh, it might wipe out people in a particular area and it could make it more difficult to, for people to speak to, with, to, to each other. I also think there's a way in which uh, the climate actually affects accent. I always say half jokingly that the reason for the Australian accent is because they're always smiling, closing their eyes against the sun and gritting their teeth against the sand. Now, for any Australian, that's probably probably insulting. But if you think about an Australian accent, the eyes are often, you know, you can make your face like that and, and sound Australian. So so it's it's kind of a joke, but I, I do think our environment changes the way we speak a little. Um, what else have we got? Okay, so. Because of all these influences, over time, languages change to be different from one another. Bear with me. Oh, I forgot. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble managing my screens. Culture, of course, makes a difference. When uh, a lot of people take on a new religion, for example, Christianity in, in parts of, of Europe or Buddhism when that came uh, into India or uh, Islam when that came from uh, the Middle East, that brings with it not only different languages, but different ideas and different ways, um, different different ways of, of communicating about ideas. Profession, as we get more and more farmers, we have more and more words that um, related to farming that come into the vocabulary. As computers have developed, we have seen a lot of the words to talk about com computers have become, um, have been adapted to speak about other things. So, so many ways in which language changes. Trade, for example, the, the Chinese used to trade with the, uh, and of course still do, with the East Coast of Africa. Ideas and languages went back and forth. If people want to do business with each other, they will learn each other's language. Philosophy, I think, is a very interesting way in, in, that influences the way language change. And I'll give you an example. Um, there used to be a time in England, and as you can hear from my accent, perhaps I, I was born in England. There used to be a time in England when TV and radio announcers always spoke in exactly the same way. 
and we used to refer to it as the Queen's English. Uh, linguists sometimes call it RP or received pronunciation. And one of the reasons for that was that the philosophy was that the best kind of English was the Queen's English. The best kind of English was the way rich people, powerful people spoke. But over the years, the philosophy of language has changed a little bit. And we now realize that the best kind of English is not necessarily the way the most powerful people speak, the way the most, the richest people speak. It, it can also be, the accent from the west of England or the accent from north of England or the accent from somebody who grew up in Tanzania or the accent from somebody who grew up in Pakistan. So philosophy actually does change the way people speak. Whereas in the past in England, people, if you wanted to rise up the social ladder, you really needed to learn to speak the Queen's English. But these days, there is much more pride in the way people um, people speak um, their, their regional variations. Okay, so bear with me just a second. So um, I'd like you to think about geographical distance. Actually, I'm going to go back a slide. Sorry, I'd like you to think about um, uh, distance and how distance affects uh, languages. So think about a group of early humans who leave the coast of Africa 20,000 years ago and they travel a thousand miles to the south and they never return. Those, that group of people over time, their vocabulary, their grammar, their pronunciation is probably going to change in very different ways. And if they th these people never return to the North, their languages are gonna become more and more different. But if it's easy to go back and forth, maybe for trade, or maybe there's a big river or um, who knows, uh, if there's a lot of contact between the groups, the languages will influence each other. And if the groups are really important to each other, if they do a lot of trade with each other, then their languages will their languages will probably remain somewhat similar. Now, these are massive generalizations. I mean, these are the, the basic ideas behind language variation, I think. Um, if the people from the South return to the North with an army, and if they beat the people in the north, they might they might say everybody in the north has to speak the way we speak because we're the best and therefore our language is the best. So that's one way in which distance changed. So if we talk about um, uh, geographical distance, let's get to this slide. Let's talk a little bit about the languages and dialects of Europe. I don't know if you can see my cursor here. Look at this red line at the bottom from Portugal and Spain in the bottom, all the way through Southern Europe to Romania. So 500 years ago, if you walked from, let's call here on the left, bottom left A, and here on the top right B, if you walked from A to B, every point along that line, within 30 kilometers, people would probably understand each other more or less, unless there was a big mountain range or a big river between them, people would probably understand each other. But if you go a little further distant, let's say 100 kilometers or 200 kilometers, the languages are probably beginning to be a little different. Maybe the pronunciation, maybe the vocabulary, maybe the grammar. And the further you go, the further you go up here, the harder it will be for people to understand each other. And that is so true about Portugal and Spain. Portugal and Spain, people can mostly understand each other. I speak Portuguese a little bit and better Spanish. When I go to Portugal, I speak what people call portanol. It's a kind of mix of the two, but people understand each other. The, there are lots of differences, but people understand each other. I haven't tried that experiment here between Spain and France, but here we have this big mountain range, the Pyrenees, which makes it difficult or more difficult for contact. So there's a bit more difference between Spanish and France. Italy, Spain, France, all these areas around here, they are all 
somewhat similar languages, even as far as Romania, which we think of as a Romance language. You can, if you were to read Romanian, if you understand a little Spanish or French, you'll probably be able to understand. Up here, things get a little different because we're seeing influences from the North. But the basic idea I'm trying to communicate is that uh, distance, geographical distance um, affects language variation. Think about India. Now, I don't know very much about India, but if you think about north-south along this um, diagonal here, think about the south. I don't know the difference between Tamil and Telugu. I wouldn't recognize Telugu or Tamil if, if I heard it, but I would predict that these languages down here are probably somewhat similar to each other. And I would predict that they were somewhat more different from Punjabi or Mawari or Gujarati or all these languages up here. And again, I, I, I defer to all you linguists out there and you speakers of Telugu and Tamil to tell me how wrong I am. But that would be my prediction. And I think that would be coherent with what we understand about language variation. In India, when the Mughals came from Persia, they brought their languages. When the Mongols came from the north, they brought their languages. When the British came, they brought their languages. When the Portuguese came, they brought their language. So these linguistic invasions change the way people speak in both directions. Think about all the English words that came from, um, that came from India. I don't know if you know this, veranda. Some of these will recognize, some of them not. Veranda, jungle, bandana, dinghy, chit, pajama, juggernaut. We may mean a big truck by that one. A Kashmir, a thug from thuggy, a chutney, bangles, shampoo, punch. We use it to mean a drink, um, a mix of fruit and alcohol, but it originally came from five punch. Cot. Loot. Oh, I've got bungalow twice. Sorry about that. Oh, no, I don't have bungalow twice. Sorry. Uh, cushy. We say, oh, that's a cushy job. And it means that's a nice job. But apparently that originally came from the word cushy happiness. I didn't know that. Khaki, of course. So lots of wood. Have you ever heard? You probably won't hear Americans say this, but um, in British English, we say, hey, hey, take a deco at that. And it means take a look. Right, and that comes from um, India, don't worry. So, so many words, Guru, Gymkhana, Jodhpurs, Kedjuri. Kedjuri for me is a mix of fish and rice and milk, pundit, lots and lots of words. Okay, so and I guarantee you there's a lot of words that are commonly used on a daily basis in India that come from um, English or perhaps uh, Portuguese like Pau. Right, I think that's um, that's a word for bread in India that comes from the word for bread in Portuguese, pao. Okay, so also let's think about the differences between um, the differences in English in the U.S. or in England. So, so I don't, I'm not very good at American dialectal variation, but because I grew up in England and because pronunciation is so important in England. I can I can do most of the British accents. Okay. So where I where I was grew up in Bristol, people talk like that. They just say, I did come from Bristol, my dear, and your voice goes up at the end. And you've got this kind of very nasal sound. And, and people say it comes from because Bristol is in a river valley where it's quite foggy. And that that's the theory. In London, people talk like that all the time, and it's a bit difficult to understand them because they use the glottal stop a bit, and it, it's quite nasal, depending on your class, right? And then um, uh, the Queen's English. I, I always joke about the Queen's English. You know, if you think about Prince Charles, Prince Charles doesn't move his face a lot. So I always say the upper classes in English kind of close their jaws very tightly and uh, they don't show too much emotion. So I always think the Queen's English, you have to, you know, just, just not show too much emotion and you never, never open your mouth too wide. So there's, there's a, a lot of vowel changes, a lot of differences between um, the vowels and the pronunciation and even the vocabulary all over England. They used to say that in England, the accent changes 
every 30 miles. And there are certainly dialectologists there who make it their business to study that, as there are in the United States. In England, for the most part, we can understand each other. Although I confess that I have difficulty understanding people from the very far north and sometimes difficulty understanding people from London if I, I haven't been to London in a while. Um, so as you can see from the map of Europe, in places where people interact, they're more likely to speak in similar ways. And the further the distance, the less likely people will understand each other. Oh, sorry, going ahead of my game. So um, if you think about the United States, now the, the, the United States has a very long history, but as a nation, it's relatively young. It's been a nation only since 1776. But we do see considerable di a dialectal variation. Um, in the South, people, um, Pallavi, I can see you raised your hand. If that's okay, put your question in the chat box and uh, we'll just come back to you a little later if that's okay. I'm not gonna answer any questions. I see uh, um, Vicky says good accents. Oh, I can do more. So so in Southern California, there's this way of speaking. So, so I went to the bank and it was very nice. It was a really hot day. And it's what we call up talk. It's a typical way that especially young women speak. In Boston, you'll, the, the way people joke about um, the Boston accent is they, they say things like, I packed my car in Harvard Yard. They have what you call the non rotasized R. They don't use the R. They don't say park my car in Harvard Yard. They say, I packed my car in Harvard Yard. Sorry, Vicky, my accent isn't very good for um, the United States. Um, in, in the southern United States, you'll hear a lot of long vowel sounds and considerable variation in grammar. People say not I could or I might, but sometimes to stress um, possibility, they say, well, I might could go. Uh, they use a double, a double modal, might could, which is very interesting. But here's the question. Is London English a dialect of the Queen's English? Is Boston English a dialect of Southern California English or vice versa? And, and who decides what is a dialect and what is a language? Okay, so here's the fun part. Linguists just can't agree about the difference between dialect and language. Um, one idea they talk about is uh, linguistic distance. How similar or dissimilar are the, uh, the languages. So if they have a very similar grammar, then that is small linguistic distance. If the sounds that people use in both languages are very similar, that is uh, minimal linguistic distance. Sentel, forgive me, I muted you. <laughs> then, um, but sometimes also the, the ideas that can be represented in a language are very different. Think about the ideas in a, a place like India or China where cultures are so different compared to England or the United States. So we, we can talk about cultural distance and cultural distance is manifested in language by the words that are used to talk about the concepts in that language, right? So. And I think this is fascinating because when you think about some of my favorite words in other languages represent these ideas that we don't have, we don't have in, in English. For example, there's a word in German that means the five pounds you put on when you broke up with your boyfriend. I can't remember the word, but I think that's just such a lovely concept. Or in Portuguese, saudade. Saudade means this, this feeling of nostalgia and for something that happened in the past, right? It's just such a lovely word. So, so many, um, there's a word in Japanese, amaeru, which is a verb that means to depend on someone in a charming way, right? So, so I just love these, these concepts. So linguistic distance, cultural distance, or the opposite, linguistic um, uh, being close to uh, each other. That's one thing that linguists, 
say determines the difference. Another um, metric, another rule of thumb is mutual comprehensibility. So if you think about mutual comprehensibility, the Spanish and the Portuguese can mostly understand each other. The people in the south of India, uh, I'm not sure if this is true, but I would predict that people who speak Telugu and Tamil probably will understand each other a little better than, than people who speak Telugu and people who speak Punjabi. I don't know if that's true, but the general principle is that, um, that um, if you can understand a speaker of another language, then we might want to think about it more towards the dialect end of the continuum than towards the language end of the continuum. But I think the thing that most linguists will agree on, and somebody very smartly wrote this um, uh, in the chat box, is that the difference between a language and a dialect is primarily of power. And thank you, Mr. Walizada, that's a great question. Is Indian English a dialect or language? So we'll get there, <laughs> I hope. I'm not going to answer that question now. So difference between language and dialect, I think, is to, related to linguistic distance, is related to mutual comprehensibility, but it's really related to political power. So a very famous fellow whose name I forget, forgive me, um, actually said that the different, uh, a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. What does that mean? That means that if you have the power to say that your dialect, the way you speak is a language and it is different from other people, uh, the way other people speak, then, then people will generally agree that that's a language. I'll give you an example. Danish, you know, think of Scandinavia, Danish, Norwegian and Sweden, um, sorry, Danish, Norwe Norwegian and Swedish are, dialects of the same language in linguistic terms. They are generally very mutually comprehensible. There is little linguistic and cultural distance, but because they are uh, the languages, because they are spoken by different nation states, they prefer to think of them, Swedes, Norwegians, and Danes prefer to think of them as languages rather than dialects of the same language. Think also, do you remember, oh, I don't know if you remember, you're probably, this is probably before your time, but for many of us here, uh, we remember the time when Yugoslavia was a country. Now, when the Soviet Union fell, uh, all of Yugoslavia was divided up into little bits. And eventually there was a war between uh, some, some parts of that, the former Yugoslavia. So. There used to be a language called Serbio-Croatian. But after the war, when the Serbs, who were, let me see if I get this right, I think the Serbs are uh, ethnically and religiously Muslim and the Croatians are ethnically and religiously Christian, when they fought against each other, please correct me if I'm wrong, that's not my area of expertise. When they fought amongst each other, and developed into two countries. Now we have a language, uh, a country called Serbia and a country called Croatia. And both the people in those countries swear, no, that's a language, it's very different from Serbian or that's a language, it's not a dialect, it's very different from Croatian. But linguists will tell you, they're basically from a linguistic perspective, uh, variations of the same language. And from a linguistic perspective, they are uh, dialects. Um, similarly, and somewhat more contentiously, most linguists think of Hindu and Urdu as one. They, we talk about Hindustani. Now, because for a variety of reasons, there's a lot of resistance to the idea. Um, and I'm not going to go too far down that road, but, but uh, if you look at the differences uh, in terms of linguistic distance and cultural distance, um, most linguists would say these are not far apart on the dialectal continuum, right? Um, Spanish and Portuguese, are they languages? Are they dialect? They're pretty much mutually intelligible to a very large degree. 
speakers of Spanish can understand Portuguese, speakers of Portuguese can understand Spanish. Does that mean they are a language or a dialect? Well, political power, because there are countries, says that they are languages, not dialect, right? So here's, here's I think, the interesting question that we get to. Is one English better than another? And lots of people will tell you yes. Lots of people will tell you, oh, British English is much better than American English. Or lots of Americans are, eh, that's Brits, they don't know what they're talking about, right? So language has power. If you are a member of the elite group, then people want to speak like you. So I would ask you to consider, and I don't have an answer for this because there are a lot of different answers. I would ask you to consider who is the, uh, is the elite in a global context? Is it uh, the people in London? Is it the people in Washington? Is it the people in Delhi? So, so which of these Englishes is best? I have no idea, but I can tell you, I can give you some suggestions for how to think about it. Here's one question. Is one English better than another? First question, better at what? Is, what is, is British English better than American English at traveling around New York? Well, the answer to that is obvious. No, American English is better than British English for traveling around New York. Is American English better than British English for traveling around London? Well, no, obviously. British English is better than American English for traveling around London. I strongly believe that no language, absolutely no language is better than another. From a linguistic perspective, there is no such thing as correct language use. Let me say that again. And all you grammar teachers out there, you can stop, stop having a heart attack. There is no such thing as correct language use from a linguistic perspective. From a grammar teacher's perspective, you can, you can, you, you can certainly say, well, that's correct and that's not correct. I, as a language teacher myself, I prefer to think about effective language use. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So, actually, let's go back a little bit. So who decides which English is best? Well, obviously, the people with the power to insist that people speak the way they do. In England, that's why they called it the Queen's English. Which variety of American English is considered best? Now, interestingly, this is what I will call the most neutral accent. When... Um, when credit card companies or hotel companies or computer companies want to hire people who are going to work in a call center in the United States and they got to call people, they want people to have what they think of as a neutral accent, an accent that doesn't sound too Northern, too Southern, too Texan, too Californian, because people have strong reactions sometimes to people from New York, or maybe New Yorkers hate Californians or Californians hate New Yorkers, but we all have ideas in our head what people from those places are like. So they want a neutral accent. And interestingly, the neutral accent in the United States comes from what we call the Midwest, right in the middle of the country. Nebraska has a lot of call centers, which is kind of interesting to me. Okay, so, so in England, the Queen's English used to be the best English. Anybody who didn't speak that way was generally thought of as less than, less educated, less important, less worth listening to, less powerful. So if you wanted to be perceived, if you wanted people to think that you were powerful or important or educated, then you changed the way you spoke. You changed your way, the way you spoke to speak the Queen's English or what we tend to call RP, received pronunciation, so that you sound as though you're a member of that very important 
elite, powerful, educated group, right? And it, yeah, it, it's fascinating. Um, what about American English? Is the kind spoken by people who come from the North or the people who come from the South the best kind of American English? I think that depends on who's asking the question and who's answering in it, right? Um, and that language is identity. Language is the way we appear in the world. So it's not just about pronunciation, it's about who you are. So when you ask a question, which kind of accent, which kind of English is best? The question you're really asking is which kind of person is best, right? And so you can see that I don't, why I say that there is no such thing as the best English because everybody is, is the best, right? Um, people fight about this stuff a lot. Um, and I could tell you long stories about the battles in uh, the school districts in California about what kind of English to teach their students. But I do want to get to some questions. So think about um, different kinds of English. How many kinds of English are there? Well, this English is an official or made a language in 75 countries. American English, Indian English, British English, Canadian English, all those Englishes you see on the screen and more. And they're all beautiful, perfect, wonderful, correct, lovely kinds of English, right? And nobody should ever, ever tell you that the kind of English you speak is not correct or not as good as, right? Let me go back to this idea of there's no language that is better than another. There is no dialect that is in itself better than another. As I say, from my perspective, there is no such thing as correct language use or incorrect language use. There's only effective language use. Think about this. You're writing an email to um, an employer. Somebody, you're, you're, you're writing to ask for a job. You want to show that you're smart. You want to show you're educated. You want to show them that you know how to spell. And you want to show them that you are, have, have a big vocabulary, right? So you probably use complete sentences, big words, formal language, and you make sure that the way you spell and punctuate is what we can think of as standard spelling. I would say not correct, but standard spelling, right? On the other hand, think about writing a text message to your friend. You wanna show you're cool, you wanna show you're close, and because you're texting, you wanna, sh you wanna be very short, right? You wanna be brief. You might use slang. You might write the letter U instead of Y-O-U, right? You might use special words that only you understand, right? Think about the opposite. Let's say you write for a job using the same style you use for a text. Let's say you write to your friend using the same style you wrote to the, the person, your, your possible employer. Your employer would not be impressed and your friend would think you've got fr you, were, you were crazy or were angry at him, right? So one of the purposes of, of language is, is to communicate ideas, but another very important function is to communicate identity. So when we speak with the Queen's English in the UK, we communicate, we are part of the elite group. When we speak with New York English, we communicate that we're from New York, right? So, Coming to the question, and then let's go to some, some of your questions at the end. Which, which English is best? I'm gonna tell you that I think the best kind of English is the English that will communicate your message and your identity most clearly and effectively. There will be times when you want to show that you are a member of an elite group. And that, that might be a time when you want to use very formal English. If you're in India, you might want to use more Indian English. If you're in London or New York, you might want to try to sound a little bit more like a New Yorker or a Londoner, right? So the best kind of English for me is 
the variety of English that will com communicate your message and identity most clearly and effectively. And remember, this is the last thought I'll leave you with. There are times that you want to play with that. You can use this idea very strategically, and I'll give you an example. I'll, I'll give you two examples. Years ago, I was driving with my mother um, in the United States, uh, down a freeway in the middle of Nevada, and we were talking so much that I was going too fast. And all behind me, I heard, Wah! the police, police stopped me. So what did I do? I put on my best British accent and I was very polite. I said, oh, officer, I'm so frightfully sorry. Uh, I'm afraid I was going too fast. My mother and I were just chatting. And he immediately understood that I was a member of an elite group because I was using uh, high status English. He also understood that I wasn't from the United States, right? And so I think partly because of that, he said, okay, ma'am, drive a little more carefully next time. Off you go, right? So that's one example of how you can use the kind of English you speak to achieve your strategic goals. Here's another example. Let's say I am walking down the street in a, uh, a poor neighborhood of New York. And I see four or five young men hanging out on the corner. Maybe they're good guys, maybe they're not so good. They're drinking beer, it's 10 o'clock at night. I'm on my own, I'm a little nervous and they say, Yo, baby, what's happening? And I, I have two choices. I can respond. I can say, oh, good evening, gentlemen. Oh, so lovely to see you. How are you? And I communicate that I'm not from their social group, that I'm from the elite group and might therefore have a little bit more money. And I think maybe I open myself, I make myself more vulnerable to any potential robbery. On the other hand, if I use their dialect, if I use their accent, I am much more likely, I, I can, yo, what's up? What's happening? What are you doing? You know, I, I can communicate. I'm from around here. I know how to handle myself. I'm not rich. Leave me alone. Okay. So with that, I'm going to add this idea at the end. You want to think about your audience and that context. And that's all. I've talked almost to the end of the hour, but let us take your questions. So if you have questions, please do uh, write them in the chat box. And I'm going to invite perhaps uh, Vicky to help me figure out which questions to answer. I promise I don't have all the answers. <laughs> well, the first question was, is in, in, are these different Englishes then, are they languages or are they dialects? That was- Well, that's, uh, well, that's a good question. Um, and so I don't have the answer to that, but I'm going to ask you to think about those three things that make the difference between a language and a dialect. Linguistic distance. Are they mutually comprehensible? Can speakers of South African English understand speakers of Singaporean English? If not, that tends to suggest they might be more distinct languages than dialects, right? Do they have political power? Would Singaporean people like to say, oh yeah, yeah, this is a language. So uh, I, don't, I don't know that I have a definitive answer to that. We can only ask questions about it. Uh, thanks for that. Um, American yeah. spelling is probably winning in today's world because of Microsoft spell checker. Is it true? I actually don't think it's true because when you choose, um, when you choose your uh, spell check, uh, you can choose British English or American English. Yes, I exactly. Have to, I change mine depending on where I am and who I'm writing to. And exactly. To keep that so mind. Somi had a question, can Indian English be understood by Britishers and Americans? Well, I think uh, you have to ask uh, which kind of Americans, which kind of British people? I, I think that's not a simple question. Mm -hmm. um, in general, speaking as uh, an American who, um, you know, who grew up in the United States, uh, in, in England, I generally have very little difficulty understanding Indian English, no more difficulty than I would have understanding somebody from who had a, a somewhat, you know, a regional variation in, um, in England or uh, in the United States. And of course, you and I are more used to listening to different Englishes. Exactly. Uh, for, so, for example, I probably understand much quicker than my husband 
in listening to different Englishes. So there's a lovely comment here from Deepika. I think this is, must have been in response to um, uh, talk about dialects. Um, Deepika says, as I understand it, the dialects of Mandarin in China can be mutually unintelligible, but they're still referred to as dialects. Now, this is a wonderful example of political power having the ability to define what a language is and what a dialect is. Depend if you're a, if you're a linguist, you there's probably I, I want to say 27 or 30 different languages in China. I, I there's certainly more than 10. I don't know if it gets to, to be 30, but because of the China, China has a centralized and very powerful government. The Chinese government gets to decide what is a language and what is a dialect. Let me see what other questions do we see. Max Weinreich, thank you very much. It wasn't the interest, it was Max Weinreich. So Let me I, see. May I add one comment for teachers? Yeah. I, I just um, find it so interesting for my students when they ask me, well, what's the right way to say something? What's, um, I often uh, do a comparative analysis. And, and so keep that in mind when you're teaching that I say, this is how we say it in India. This is how we say it in the US, in the UK. So, um, yeah, thanks, Vicky. Deepika, you have great questions and comments. Um, you say, how can we, as teachers, encourage learners to focus on their own English rather than a specific standard variety? How can we encourage them to expose themselves to multiple English? Well, I think you've got a number of really interesting questions in there. Maybe I can break that down a little bit. So uh, maybe I can give that, uh, um, give you a couple of examples. The first thing is, I cannot teach you how to speak the way somebody else speaks. I can teach you how to speak the way I speak, right? Because when I'm saying, okay, listen, vocabulary, repeat after me, vocabulary, listen to me, aluminium, <laughs> right? Vicky's laughing because in the United States, we say aluminum, right? Um, I will teach you how to speak the way I speak. So I think teachers themselves can only realistically teach their students to speak the way they speak. So if you are a native speaker of Indian English, you are probably wasting your time if you try to teach them how to speak American English, because my American, accent, my American accent is not natural. I mean, I have a bit of an American accent, but I can't teach people to speak Texan English or Scottish English. So you will want to teach them to speak the way you speak. I think what's important is that you expose them to a variety of different varieties. Note, I don't use dialect, a, a, a variety, uh, sorry, a range of different varieties of English. So if you use recorded materials, and most textbooks do this, if you use recorded materials these days, make sure that or ideally you want them to listen to Indian English, British English, Jamaican English, American English. The other thing I think you can do is to highlight for them to the degree that you're aware, highlight for them some of the differences, right? So for example, if you're saying, if you know, for example, that in Indian English, you say car, I don't know if that's the case, and Americans tend to say car, or uh, British people say car, or Australians say car, right? You can highlight that for them if you want, if you think it's important, if you have the time, right? Um, so this question, how can we encourage them to expose themselves to multiple Englishes? Well, they can, you can give them listening tasks to listen to the BBC, to listen to the Voice of America, to listen to, you know, all those radio shows uh, from around the world. That you can give them listening tasks so that they can improve their listening skills to those varieties. I hope that's a good answer. I think we should probably just take one more answer. I'm happy to stay a little bit longer, but uh, um, uh, I want to kind of draw a natural end. So somebody said, in the past, writers agonized over writing in English rather than their native languages. Now they have appropriated the English language as their own and introduced words from native languages into English. And I think this is really just such an interesting idea because I think it asks the question, whose English is it? 
who owns English, Ooh. right? Ooh. Well, I think the beauty of English is that it is um, from all over the world. Every, and th this is why we are teaching English because we believe, you know, and this is why you're learning English because we believe that English, for right or wrong, for good or bad, is becoming a universal language. And if you've read David Gradle's book on world Englishes and uh, the future of English in India, I think that's the title. You know, language change is constant. So at the same time, English is expanding. More and more people around the world are speaking English, but individual small varieties of English are emerging. I bet you at St. Joseph's, you have your own special words for things. Right. And if if we put a big wall around around Telangana or Andhra Pradesh, probably um, you folks down there would end up speaking a completely different form of English. Right. And now you're scaring me. I can see and listen to my fellow linguists articulating very well. Sakala Stanley from Zambia. I have to say I'm a little scared um, to be making this presentation to you because I am. Um, I have a degree in applied linguistics and I almost have a master's degree in linguist, uh, linguistics, but this is, I, I, I'm a language educator, so this is not my area of expertise. If this is something you're interested in, I, I encourage you to, to dive into it. Read David Gradle on World Englishes, right? Look at, there's so much information on the internet about dialect and, and language. Um, so with that, I think I will stop unless Vicky thinks I should continue. No, and um, I, but I would like to ask everyone to put their video on for just one moment so that I could have a, a screenshot, please. I won't, it won't take long. <clears throat> and I would just like to, while you're doing that, uh, give a word of thanks to you, Ruth. Thank you for taking the time. I know how busy you are. Um, and I know that we've been actually working on this for several months to find a, a fifth Saturday that she would be available to us. So um, my heartfelt thanks and gratitude. You've added so much to the Language Center by offering this uh, talk on, on Englishes and dialects and languages. It was uh, just uh, wonderful. Thank you. And my pleasure. Let me just let me just say for all you professors of linguistics on this uh, webinar, please understand that I, as I said, I'm not an expert. If I've said something that you disagree with, please disagree with me. I love it when people disagree. So, and, and let me know how wrong I am. We all can learn, and I look forward to learning from you if you have the time to educate me. So, thank you so much. Okay. I'm going to take a, a no, screenshot. No. I'm just going to count to three so you can smile and a few people can still turn on their videos. One, two, three. Thank you. One more page. There's a second page here. One, two, three. All right. Thank you all. And I would just like to end with saying happy Diwali. Jai Hind. Thank you all. You're all saying thank you in the uh, chat box. Thank and you, you are, so much. You're so welcome. For thank organizing you, Irene. This. And thank you all for coming. Pass on our gratitude to Ruth. It was a wonderful session. Thank I you. Will. Thank you. And happy Diwali to you too. Thank you. Well, we won't be celebrating it here, but. I know, but you'll be with us in our yes, mind and in I'll our spirit. I'll be thinking of you all, definitely. Okay. Okay. <laughs>